Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to War in the Pacific Admirals Edition by Matrix and Slytherin Games, and it is our play-by-email game against XTRG, which we're going to be taking a look at here today. Uh, this video will be cut up kind of in two pieces. One, we're going to be looking at the combat replay for the date of December 15th, 1941, and once we do that, then I'm actually going to do a update. So I'm not going to record the update, but I'll do an update uh, that will... Uh, update the game to the most recent database, and I'll also see about updating the mod with the, the maps, because apparently there have been some uh, enhancements to the modification since then. So uh, that's what we're going to be looking at here today. You can see the days getting off to uh, some anti-submarine uh, warfare actions off the northeast coast of uh, the uh, Hawaiian Islands, which don't appear to be doing much of anything. Uh, meanwhile, our motor torpedo boats here, the British motor torpedo boats, trying to escape from Hong Kong are making a sail for the Philippines where they're going to refuel here and they appear to have run into a Japanese task force of five destroyers and one light cruiser um, so I don't think my ships have much of any uh, fuel left let alone any ammunition here uh, but fortunately here it's only 10% moonlight so it looks like they were able to uh, escape and disengage here without too much damage uh, it didn't look like any of them took any shell hits so I'm hoping that they withdraw uh, to Iba where they can refuel and uh, and be good there. So that's the objective. Refuel at Iba, uh, pull a little bit of fuel out of the uh, Philippines, and then uh, we'll probably get them moving somewhere else where they can do something. I don't know. Um, temporary flotation repairs failing on a ship here in the uh, Strait of Malacca, which is a uh, cargo ship, so no worries there. Meanwhile, a destroyer off the coast of Java suffering some flooding damage. Um... We'll speed things up a little bit. We're moving into the day phase here with the naval reaction and air units. Uh, so you can see here a uh, Japanese submarine here off the southern coast of the uh, main island of Australia here. And you can see it's penetrating an AKL, a Canopus here. Two torpedo hits. She's probably sunk, but she's a light transport. Uh, so I'm not really worried about that. Just, I guess, worth noting that there's a Japanese submarine on the sort of southern tip of... Uh, the uh, island of Australia. So that's something we need to keep in mind. We have a lot of troops moving around in that area, uh, so we obviously need to uh, be careful with that. Um, let's see here. A bunch of recon flights over Singapore. Looks like there's some recon flights there in the south. Hopefully they didn't spot our, uh, our fleet carriers there. We've got three fleet carriers to the southeast corner of um, the... Uh, islands of Hawaii. Meanwhile, uh, a, a lone bomber approaches our forces here in China. Japanese aircraft over Suva Bay here in uh, Fiji. More Japanese bombing here north of Canton. It's also bombing our forces over here in the northeast. Um... So far, not a lot has happened this turn. I think the major thing was we were going to start trying to bomb the airfield of Kotaburu at night, which obviously didn't occur. That's fine. I think it takes a day to change your orders from air uh, day combat to night combat. Uh, we have a small air, ra air raid going in on Bangkok, uh, attempting to bomb the oil facilities there. Doesn't look like any bombs hit their target. Uh, Japanese aircraft continue to fly recon missions. But it looks like we've got overclassed all over... Uh, the islands, or the peninsula of the Malay, the Malay Peninsula, so that may be why there's limited air activity. I really need to get some fighters up over near Canton, and maybe, you know, there's a lot of, I think, vulnerable Japanese aircraft here we could probably shoot down. These are, this is a fertile training ground for his, uh, chi for his aviators here in China at this rate. And we've got a good 40 P-40s uh, in the Flying Tigers to really kind of teach them a little bit of a lesson. So we should be able to use them. It's just a question of guessing the right target to do a combat air patrol over. Um, surface combat check. The other thing I think we're also waiting to see what happens on is the attack at um, uh, at Mersing on the Malay Peninsula. I ordered my brigade there to launch a shock attack to try and throw the Japanese battalion into the sea. Uh, oh boy. What's this? I saw something about fast transport. So Japanese light cruisers and destroyers here are bombarding the coast near Mersing. Uh, they are losing some soldiers here. It looks like one non-combat squad was destroyed. 
Oh, but it looks like they... I don't know if they're bringing... Well, wait, no, they're, they're losing casualties, so they must be landing new troops. Oh, shit. Now we're going to be launching a shock attack against some element of reinforcements. I don't know how many men the Japanese could bring in this, but uh, I kind of hope my troops fail their morale check and don't attack now, because uh, I don't really know what I'm going to be up against. Meanwhile, Japanese shock attacked at uh, Huilin. I'm kind of surprised. They reduced the fortification, but they didn't actually take the fort. All I have is a headquarters unit there, so good job to that headquarter unit. Meanwhile, a deliberate attack over here to the northeast is this, it's like Chungsha or Chungking or something. I, I, not, I can't remember the name of the city over here. Uh, it's near Kaifeng. Uh, the Japanese brought 10,000 attackers. We just got a second corps to arrive on the field here as reinforcements. So we actually brought reinforcements in. Uh, the Japanese attacks were one to four, so they actually did not achieve a fort reduction, uh, and we were able to win the battle, or at least win the day. Japanese lost about 366 casualties. Nothing destroyed, though, just a few guns. Uh, we did lose a couple of combat infantry squads destroyed, so that was a relatively tame attack. Meanwhile, the Japanese are shock attacking at Victoria Point here on the edge of the Malay Peninsula, and they destroyed the four P-40s that we had there that were trying to repair. Meanwhile, our shock attack here looks like they brought in an SNLF force, of about 50 combat value. Our assault odds were one to two. Uh, we actually were outnumbered by the defenders. They have fewer guns than us, um, but anyway. So one to two, they lost 37 casualties. We lost 284, that's a pretty bad beat for us. We have a second brigade on the way, so hopefully they arrive next turn and can be put into the defensive, because if the Japanese counterattack now, we might actually lose that battle. Meanwhile, bombardment attack near Pao Tau. It looks like our troops had more guns, more troops, and more assault value. So it might be worth uh, trying to launch an attack there next turn. Meanwhile, Japan's bombarding here in Araquif. We have two corps that are pretty badly beaten up. So they're probably going to win there when they launch an actual deliberate attack. And I think that's going to do it for this turn here. Several airfields expanded, and we'll probably drop out to the main screen here, and then I'll flash you over to the updated version with the updated mod. Um, yeah. See you on the flip side, guys. All right, and we're back here uh, into our turn. So if we take a look here, I did just update the mod, so the graphics are a little bit different than they were before. You can see the land looks a lot different, the water looks a lot different, and so do some of these uh, unit uh, icons and things like that. So... I don't know what the name of this mod is, to be honest. I just have a Google Drive link to where the, uh, the individual who shared it with me has it located. So I can throw that in the description, but guys, I have no idea. I can't vouch for this in any way. Um, so obviously download at your own risk, but it seems to work well for me. Uh, the Dutch colors really pop. They're a lot prettier, a lot nicer. The texture seems to be enhanced a bit. But where the real enhancements lie is when you go into the actual unit panels. So if we go in here and we take a look, you know, here's the, the, the repulse, and uh, they still haven't refueled yet. You can see this icon looks a little bit different, but what's really special in my opinion, when you click on the actual ship, you've got this icon on the ship. The icon looks relatively similar, but the camouflage and the paint schemes for the ship's different. You get a nice little icon here that uh, is different for every single ship, kind of like the, the ship's seal, if you will. So that's all really cool. Um, and again, I, I really like the enhancements they made to the Dutch. Uh, the map is a little bit less clear, I feel like. For the enemy units, it's very standout-ish. But I feel like the ships kind of blend in with the water a bit here, these icons for the vessels. So just kind of a cool little thing. I don't know if the mod has a name. I've asked uh, XTRG a few times what the name of the mod is, and all he has ever really does is give me the link. So um, essentially all you have to do is when you download... Uh, the information from the Dropbox, it's an art file. You just put the art file in. You replace your existing art file in your War in the Pacific directory with the new art file that the uh, modder has created. Uh, just make sure you create a backup of your original art file because if anything goes wrong, obviously you just want to swap it back out. Uh, to get it working. Um, with that being said, guys, uh, let's take a look at the repulse here. So she is not refueled yet. She wasn't able to do it at Oosthaven. The ship there that we did order her to do it is a tanker, so she can't replenish underway. So what we're doing instead is we're sending her down here to Christmas Island, uh, which she does have enough fuel for, I checked. And this is just a little bit west of Java. Should be out of the uh, range of any J Japanese sort of uh, land-based uh, bombers. Hopefully it's also out the range of where he might send any submarines if he has anything in the, in the 
um, Java Sea or anything off the coast of Sumatra. My hope is by now he's pa- this ship has passed where those vessels would be located. So we're heading him to Christmas Island. There is no uh, Christmas Island number 10. There is no um, fuel at Christmas Island, and there's also certainly no facilities to load the fuel onto the ships. What we're doing, though, is we have a small task force of small Dutch fleet oilers, AOs are replenishment fleet oilers, uh, and we are sending them to to uh, meet up with that task force. I had been, you know, these were part of the tankers that I was using to pull fuel out of the Dutch East Indies, but these are really small fleet oilers. They're really slow. They only carry a total of 1,550 fuel per ship, and we've only got four of them. So um, low risk if they somehow get intercepted or get, you know, because they're being delayed. Uh, we're going to send them at flank speed here to meet up with the task force as quickly as possible. The 6,000 fuel should be more than enough uh, to top off the tanks of the certainly enough for the destroyers there you can see they have about 280 total fuel in their bunkers and there's what three of them uh or two of them actually so in terms of what they're going to need filled up i mean even if we assume they were at zero which they won't be um that'll be about 500 fuel uh, and that'll leave about 5,000 left over for the uh repulse which admittedly does take quite a bit more it takes around what is this um I can't do math. 3,500 fuel would be roughly its full complement. But even so, uh, with the 6,000 fuel in these four tankers, we'll have enough to fuel up all the ships uh, and then some. So we'll just basically replenish them, and then we'll send those uh, tankers back or those uh, fleet oilers back in, in, into the Dutch East Indies, maybe at Tijilap. We'll top them back off and then send them back south. Um, you can see here we're really pulling a lot of fuel out of the island of Java here. We're down to 44,000 in Soria Bay, or Soria Bay um, and we don't have anything more than that anywhere else here. Uh, we have, uh, just on ships in port, we have over 36,000 units of fuel on these ships most of these are cargo ships so you can see here these ships are transporting fuel they can't do it very effectively uh, you can see here that some of these ships like at 100 it carries 2900 total supply can only carry 1450 fuel so it's not an efficient use of fuel uh, but it's good enough. I mean, this, this ship has just enough fuel to get to Australia, so it's going to basically need to eat up 400 fuel of the, uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe like 600 if it uses a little more than its actual complement. But in any event, it might have to use five or 600 fuel to fill itself back up, but that still results in about 800 additional fuel getting to Australia, which can be used for whatever it needs to be used for. So... Again, they're not super efficient to use cargo ships to transport fuel, but in the case where you're just trying to get as much out as you can, they generally can cover their operating costs and still uh, benefit you by bringing that extra fuel to Australia. So we're in the process of doing that with a bunch of different ships here. Uh, we've got uh, three task forces docked up uh, that are loading fuel. We've also ordered some of these other task forces to load fuel this turn as well. And that's the situation there. Meanwhile, we've put uh, some ships into dry dock here. Uh, we've got a submarine, which I think was just completed. It's system damage, nothing else. It'll be at pier side for four days. The Deroiter, the light cruiser, will be in dry dock for f about 15, 16 days on the island of Java. And then we have the destroyer Vampire, which will be in port for about five days. Meanwhile, those heavy cruisers have arrived here uh, at, Bat at Batavia. We've put two light cruisers that need some basic shoreside repairs done uh, into that. And then we have some uh, warships here at uh, Batavia here. We've got two heavy cruisers, the Exeter and the Cornwall, both British, uh, both sporting 8-inch guns. We've got a lot of light cruisers. What we don't have a lot of is really is destroyers. We've got a few, but not a ton. Um, but hopefully that'll change soon. Meanwhile, you can see we've got about 20,000 fuel coming, coming out of Palembang, 37,000 fuel coming out of Singapore. Uh, so we're, I think, effectively evacuating a lot of the fuel. There's still a lot left over. There's still over 64,000 fuel at Singapore, but at least we're getting some of that out in a way. Meanwhile, he didn't attack Singapore. He didn't really launch much in the way of any land-based land naval bombing attacks. I think, if I was him... And this is always a risk. But if I was him, what I would do is he knows that Singapore is largely untouched. So if I was going to be him, I would send my first attack against Singapore would not actually be a bunch of bombers that are going to be vulnerable to being shot up in an area that you have not yet wrested control from the enemy. What I would do is I would send... Uh, some fighters to sweep the skies, maybe some zeros. And we did see his two light carriers that are moving west 
Uh, they were in the Bay or in the South China Sea over in this general vicinity, what, a turn or two ago? They're probably over here at Kamran Bay, maybe this task force here that we're citing here uh, in Kamran Bay. So my assumption is they're probably going to fuel up and then they're going to head west uh, and try and reduce uh, the Air Force at Singapore. I suspect they will be successful, but my goal is to take as many zeros and as many uh, well-trained pilots out as we can. So I think what I'm going to do here this turn is I'm going to give, and this is a risk because he could get in a, some cheap licks on our airfield, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to order my fighters here down to stand down. Not fully, we're still going to put a cap up, but we're only going to put 20% of our fighters in the air as a combat air patrol because currently our fighter fatigue is at around 30 uh, for our highest fatigued unit. Uh, and 17, 23, 21. These 17, 23, 21 aren't particularly high, but after this turn, I'm going to start ratcheting the cap up to 40 or 50 percent or maybe even more once we know the enemy is in the air. Because my only chance is that maybe he sends 30 or 40 zeros over Singapore and we meet him with 70 fighters. You know, maybe in that scenario, just sheer weight of numbers will, will punish him quite a bit, hopefully. Um, but the only way that that works is if those pilots are really, really well rested. So I'm going to give these guys a, a bit of a light day. And if he does send anyone sweeping, it's probably just going to be the equivalent of like one fighter group. So 20 on 20 or something like that would be my guess, but I'm not really sure. Meanwhile, I'm also going to start dispersing some of my aircraft. So I have two uh, small air units that are moving up toward Johar Baru because I've got a level four airfield there, but I don't have enough aviation support here. So when he does start hitting Singapore, my hope is to have maybe 60 or 70 aircraft based out of Johar Baru to protect our air force somewhat. Um, and that way, you know, even if they do destroy a lot of aircraft on the ground at Singapore, it won't kill us in one fell swoop. And frankly, his carriers only have a limited number of sorties that they can fly before they have to head back to port to replenish. And I think the closest port they'd be able to replenish at is Cameron Bay. So again, that way, maybe he comes in for three or four days of bombardment, then he has to pull out. And we can use that time to, to slowly start rebuilding our airfields. Granted, they can keep hitting us with land-based bombers, but it'll at least be somewhat of a respite, I think. Um... Meanwhile, uh, these other troops continue to fall back on Johar Baru. We did lose uh, pretty substantial casualties at the Battle of Mersing. He may be able to take the port next turn. Our brigade there, our Australian brigade, is down to 45 assault value. We do have some reinforcements on the way. We have one brigade of Australians. Uh, the 27th Infantry Brigade is marching. They're about 12 miles away, so it's possible... Um, and actually, I'm going to shift them over into combat stance. It's possible that they show up. I don't know if they'll march 12 miles in combat stance, but given they're going to be crossing uh, a territory potentially being engaged in combat, I'll take that risk. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, but I think if he's going to attack, it'll probably be next turn with those two battalions of infantry that he has in place here. So hopefully those guys arrive in time to give the Japanese a bit of their own lesson of, of sort of a bloody surprise. But if they don't, then uh, that brigade at least will arrive and hopefully pin the Japanese in place because then they'd still have to... Uh, sort of dislodge that brigade before they can march westward across the peninsula. So I'm not too worried about two units of like 70 uh, attack value. I can keep funneling troops in here and I think keep them pinned down uh, until troops from the north start moving south. Meanwhile, it does look like he started to move some units down the Malay Peninsula. It's taken him quite a while to get into action, but we do see one unit moving here to the west of Singora. It'll probably be at Aloha Star. He also took the base at Victoria Point here. We lost four Flying Tiger aircraft that were in disrepair on the ground, so he may be expecting them in Singapore. I'm not sure. Uh, meanwhile, we've moved a Buffalo squadron here forward to Tavoy. Uh, they're going to do, what are they going to do? Are they going to do anything? They're going to do a fighter sweep over Bangkok here uh, because they've got a good airfield, a level four airfield. They've got sufficient uh, aviation support. So we're going to base them forward here, sweep Bangkok, and we're going to keep bombing Bangkok uh, with our Blenheim ones that we have based out of Mulman. Um, I may want to move forward some of these IF Blenheims as well, but I don't really have a lot of aircraft so we may move those Blenheims forward here as well to kind of increase our offensive striking power in Burma, but for the moment, that's what it is. Uh, meanwhile, not a lot else to report in the Philippines. We've got one unit that's arrived here at Patangas, uh, the first Phil or 51st Filipino Infantry Division. They're going to stand and fight there. They're going to wait for the Japanese to show up and hopefully slow them down. We've also got the 194th Tank Battalion, which is on the way, which hopefully will also delay the Japanese from driving in. Meanwhile, we've evacuated most of our ground units from uh, the uh, city of Manila uh, to uh, Clark Field. 
Uh, and I actually really should. What's Clark Field's aviation support? Oh, that's a lot of aviation support. Can we move these guys via rail to Clark Field? I don't know if I can do that. Yes, I can. All right, I'm going to move all my aircraft to Clark Field. Uh, it's not really in good shape. He's bombed it kind of into a, into pretty bad damage. The runway is actually repaired now, uh, but the service damage is still 41. But I'm going to move my fighters over here so that the uh, repair crews at Clark Field can work on these guys and we can help uh, you know, s tidy these guys up a bit to allow them to maybe escape uh, from, from the, the trap that is the Philippines here. So we'll go ahead and pull these guys over by rail, back to Manila. And just like that, we're pulling out most of our Air Force. I should really switch this over here uh, from uh, Clark Field, or from Manila and into Clark Field. Manila is not going to be a strong point for us. Uh, really, the strong point is going to be uh, Batan with Clark Field being used as a little bit of a buffer just to give us a little bit more time to build our fortifications up. If we take a look at Batan here, you can see we've got level 59% of the way completed to level 3 forts. My hope is to have level 4 forts before he engages us there, but I don't know how realistic that is or not. Uh, meanwhile, move these guys back. Now, it does kind of put all our eggs in one basket, in the Clark Field basket, which was the problem the first time around. But uh, interestingly enough, since my fighters kind of stopped rising to face his bombers, it feels like his air forces in the region have been much more passive. So it'll be interesting to see if that maintains itself. Frankly, we don't have a lot of aircraft here to worry about in the first place. We'll leave the scouting aircraft where they are. Uh, meanwhile, I have some air support units heading to EBA so we can try and get these 12 Warhawks that are on the ground here and damaged, repaired, and back into the air. We've moved the majority of our flyable P-40s down here towards Zambroga. Uh, we have four aviation support there. We've got six aircraft there. We've also started moving elements of squadrons. We've bought out their, per their purchase points, so we're moving them toward Singapore. So we've got four P-40Bs based out of Miri, and we've got seven, or actually eight, based out of Kuching, and the objective here next turn will be to fly those eight fighters uh, into the Malay Peninsula to bolster our air defenses there. So we've got a lot of buffaloes. We've got like 65 buffalo fighters that are active at Singapore, but the buffalo shit. The P-40 is actually a pretty solid aircraft. Still going to be horribly outmaneuvered by the Zero, but it's a much more sturdy aircraft. It can take a lot more punishment than the buffalo. Um, so... And it's got more firepower than the Buffalo. So moving the P-40s into the Malay Peninsula should help, especially if that's where the main effort of his Air Force is going to turn. I don't know that for sure either. I mean, he can move down this way or go after Sing Kuang or whatever, but uh, that's kind of my goal is making Singapore and Johar Bahru the uh, anchors of our defense here and kind of act as a block of any Japanese units trying to move south. Additionally, we do have 23 Buffaloes that are going to be on... Uh, combat air patrol over Singapore as well. Just in case he gets a little bit aggressive, these guys are going to be doing a long-range cap. 23 Buffaloes flying out of uh, Dejabi, uh, and uh, they'll probably take uh, some fatigue hits right now. Their fatigue's low. They'll probably be at like 20 or 30, but I can kind of slowly stand these guys back down as the other guys stand up, and then what we'll do with these guys is we'll, we'll give these guys a rest down here in the south until it becomes clear that the Japanese are committing their forces to Singapore, and then for a day or two we'll surge them in at like 70 or 80 percent cap uh, to maybe give the Japanese a surprise as you know perhaps an additional 30 or so aircraft show up because we've got one more squadron here back at Palembang with another 12 uh, buffaloes as well um, it's kind of split up right now seven are at Palembang we can move them forward if we need to four are at Merrick I'm waiting for those to get repaired and then I'll fly them forward so we can add an, ad an additional 36 fighters all told, between the uh, 10 P-40s coming from the Philippines, hopefully that number increases, but at least in the next two to three days, we should have about 10 P-40s coming in from the Philippines, and we'll have a total of about 36 to 35 P or buffaloes flying out of Sumatra. So that gives us about 45 aircraft located outside of Singapore. And then the fighters that we currently have sta on station there, we've got 83 of them, but six 68 are ready. So that'll give us a total fighter force of around 103 fighter aircraft, uh, of which about 30 of them are going to be modern P-40s, and the rest will be somewhat obsolete. So not many, but, you know, if he sends 40 or 50 zeros, maybe if we can get them right up in the right configuration, enough to give him a bloody nose. Or if he's foolish and sends bombers without adequate escorts or with nates even uh, as escorts, then maybe we can get some licks in and ravish him there. 
Speaking of Ravish, uh, one of my other strategies for this turn is going to be trying catching some of the Japanese bombers in China. I think he's using China as a training base for some of his units by bombing some of our ground units where the Japanese don't really face much risk of retaliation. But I do have two additional squadrons of Flying Tigers. Uh, one is based uh, currently out of Quilin. Uh, and we've got 22 of them. They're a little bit tired. Their fatigue level's 40. They've been training around a bit. But uh, I'm going to fly them in a long-range cap over the 62nd Chinese Corps. Uh, the Japanese bombed them without fighter escort with like 30 or 40 bombers last turn, as well as the turn before that. So my hope is that even though they're tired... I mean, if they meet enemy modern fighters, they're going to be screwed. But my hope is that he sends another 30 or 40 bombers in here, and maybe we can get like 10 or 10 of them or so just via surprise. Additionally, we're going to do the same thing up north here. Uh, actually, where are we doing that? Is it Quillen? I forget where I ordered that. I think I ordered them over here. Where are they flying out of? They're flying out of Yan'an. No, that's not them. Oh my goodness. No, they're flying out of Changchao. So I'm flying them over Queeth over here, where the Japanese have also been uh, bombing our troops here as well. So my hope is that maybe, just maybe, uh, we can surprise the Japanese a bit and uh, hit them hard in two different locations and uh, maybe, you know, maybe take out 20 fighters of, of pilots that are training and kind of surprise them there and, and impact their ability to... Uh, you know, use China, make him think twice when it comes to using China as a training base and slow down his training process of new pilots. Um, those are kind of the big things this turn. Um, my carriers off the uh, coast of Hawaii, I thought I saw some recon over them. I saw a bunch of recon over here. It might have been us spotting his subs, but I could have sworn I saw a notice of maybe them spotting us. So they may have spotted our three carriers over here. Uh, I am ordering the carriers to start moving now that we've got all three groups, and they're going to be moving toward uh, Palmyra. Uh, but what we're going to do first is we're actually going to have... Uh, well, they're going to move toward Palmyra, and then we're going to, while they're moving that way, we're going to hopefully have a replenishment force with about 23,000 fuel meet them and top off the fuel bunkers of these uh, task forces. If there's some extra fuel, then they'll accompany them. Otherwise, they'll head back to Pearl and refuel. And then we're going to have the carriers go to Palmyra. From Palmyra, I think we're going to have the carriers move south and then west and move them into Pago Pago, where I have some 40,000 fuel uh, on the way. Um, maybe not Pago Pago, maybe actually Suva. In any event, I've got large amounts of fuel on the way to both Pago Pago and Suva uh, here, where I can defend the supply lines with Australia. Uh, we did detect something Japanese over here. I don't really know what it is. We sighted one ship, could be a submarine, could be something else. But I'm sending some surface task forces in to investigate. Uh, they're heading northwest, so if they are ships, they may get away. But if not, I just need to make sure that there's no surprises because I do have a uh, transport task force with a brigade of infantry coming over here toward the western tip of Fiji. And then I also have another transport task force over here off the coast of the southern portion of Hawaii. Uh, heading in that general direction as well. We also did spot a Japanese submarine. Uh, it sank one of our AKLs down here. So something we need to be mindful of, our troop transports really don't have much in the way of escorts. They've only got a patrol boat, but at least they're faster than the average transport. They can make over 15 knots, uh, and we have them moving at full speed. So hopefully they, you know, they're not the... the, the uh, Japanese, if they do encounter them, aren't able to get a, a firing solution. On them. We also have uh, some of our surface ships over here are moving back to meet up with the two tra transport task forces uh, to uh, provide escort. So they're going to merge with them and then uh, kind of hang out. Um, me, other than that, there's just a lot of ships moving around, so a lot of ships moving off map for my ships as I kind of try and order things to get into position. We've got a bunch of convoys coming out of the U.S. providing supplies. Um, we kind of already showed repulse. If we take a look at Singapore here, the Prince of Wales is doing a little bit better. Um, she's still only able to make six knots, uh, so uh, top speed still not high enough, although this turn, its cruising speed went from one knot to three knots, so that's improvement and good to see. Uh, from a repair standpoint, its flood damage dropped another six or seven points down to 51. This flood damage won't drop anymore because it's equal to the major flooding, but essentially the flooding damage is like 20 points better than it was when it first entered port. Uh, so much less likely to sink, although 51 is still a ton of flooding damage. There's a reason this is like a pinkish red. 
Uh, meanwhile, I'm hoping the engine repair starts uh, in earnest and that this gets down the extra 15 points down to the 38 major engine. And the system damage has already dropped. I think it was like 22 earlier. It's dropped down to 15. Uh, so I'm going to keep an eye on that. And as soon as this drops, you know, enough and we get the speed up to hopefully above 10 knots, uh, then we may try and pull it out. Uh, but we do know that the Japanese have large numbers of bombers at Kotaburu, and I think it's going to be important that we don't allow them to take any airfields south of Kotaburu uh, before the Prince of Wales uh, basically gets out. The other complicating factor is it takes two days for the Prince of Wales to set sail. Japanese have carriers over here if they really are coming for Singapore. If we try and pull the, the Prince of Wales out now, they'll probably still be too close and get hit by enemy uh, fighter aircraft as they're leaving. So they might actually be safer in the shipyard for now anyway, at least until that carrier task force has to... Ter uh carrier task force has to move on but our other fighters in this area like the 36 fighters we have on dutch the dutch east indies uh, are ideally placed to support that uh, battleship as it tries to retreat south the question just becomes if we have enough fighter support uh, because we did spot a, a nell bomber here at kota Baru, which has very long legs uh, but I don't know how many long-ranged fighters he would have for escort still he might be able to overwhelm any cap we put up over the over the ships um, that about does it for this turn, guys. Uh, there is one other thing I'll call out. Fighting going on in China. Uh, I am waiting at Yichang. I think we've got some additional units about to arrive here. We've got about 700 assault strength. We've ordered several of these units basically to go into reserve uh, to try and get their uh, assault value back up for additional assaults. Uh, we know the enemy has about 25,000 troops, 125 guns, and 40 armored vehicles. One Japanese division is in really good shape, so what we have there is nowhere near enough to deal with them. But the good news is we've got uh, two Chinese corps here in the north that are marching their way toward uh, toward. Yichang. One of them is pretty weak. It's sort of a miniature core. Uh, it's got about 39 infantry squads, but the other one is a good healthy core, 348 infantry squads, 377 assault value. So that may, I mean, that's equal basically to a Japanese division's assault value. And then we have two other strong cores that are also coming, but they're much further away. They're both over 32 miles away, probably several days. In addition to that, we got two cores on this roadway here between Yichang and Hankou. So my hope is that by these guys being here, it's going to cut Yichang off from any supply. If he sends any troops east, he may be able to break that hold and, and reinitiate supply. But if he doesn't, then my hope is that I can kind of strangle this city down and kind of reduce its supply and then make the Japanese even less effective. The only thing I don't know, though, is it is on these major riverways, so he may be getting waterborne supply. I'm not really sure. Um, I'm not sure how that works. If any of you know, uh, obviously speak up and let me know. Uh, additionally, he appears to be making a move here just to the northeast of Changshao. Uh, last turn, or two turns ago, he attacked with one division there and we held firm. Uh, it looks like a second division has arrived, or actually more than that. He's got five, five units, so whatever that equals, 16,000 infantry units. But he attacked again, and this time it was a stronger attack. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, we had a new corps arrive, so our assault, I think it was the 90th corps arrived last turn, and turned his assault back in a bloody repulse. Uh, but we only have 484 uh, assault value kind of hanging out there in open with no forts. Uh, the main goal there is to provide some time here for Cheng Shao to, to build additional forts. We got a second fort in place, and we have uh, about 8,000 troops in place, about 450 assault value. Whatever comes of these two units, they'll fall back there. Theoretically, if they got in there now, we could double the assault value. I'm not sure that's good enough to hold the city or not, but it is what it is. This is a pretty important city, too, because if he took Changshao and he cleared this railway line, then he would be linking up uh, Sinan, Hengkau, and uh, Wuchang, all with the main rail line that moves through China. He's got a bunch of these cities all linked up via rail, um, but if Changshao falls, currently these these four cities here, Yi Chang, uh, Sinang, uh, Hangkou, and Wuchang do not have any rail supplies. They can move rails between each other, these two cities specifically, but he can't rapidly move reinforcements uh, from, from the south here up this way because he has no clear line of, line of path for the railways, so he can't strategically move troops around China that way, um, just more along the coast. If he takes uh, Changchao, then he theoretically could do that, assuming he's he kicks out these units over here uh, near Queeth, which he probably will. They're very weak units. Uh, then he'll have that whole rail line clear all the way back to Shanghai. What we're doing to counter that is we've uh, 
basically put troops on the rail line here to the east of Xinyang, and we're also, we have troops in Xinyang as well. So the rail line, even if this fell today, which it won't because there's no troops there, uh, would not be open. Uh, and actually, I think I've got a good chance of taking Xinyang. I've ordered some recon flights over the city, uh, but he has two units in place. I think those are the two I just pushed into Xinyang because I just attacked... Was it right here? I just attacked and drove those troops in. And in addition to that, we've got a bunch of units that just arrived in Xinyang. We've got an assault value of 1,139 uh, ready to go. So if these are really just the battered remnants of that last battle, then I think I'll attack and hopefully destroy these units. Uh, certainly maybe rout them, but maybe even just destroy them all together uh, and, and take this city. Then if he takes Changchao, he still has to take Xinyang. Uh, and I think that leaves him a little bit vulnerable uh, to to that. Additionally, if we take this and he still hasn't taken Chengchao, then we could potentially strategically move this large number of assault value using interior lines back over to Chengchao and, uh, and relieve those troops there. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, in terms of total losses last turn, we didn't lose anything air to air. He lost one aircraft. We didn't lose anything on the ground. He lost nothing. We lost one aircraft to flak. So did he. Six ops losses for us, four for him. Uh, so not really much uh, to speak of. We still don't have any fighter aces. We lost five pilots missing, 48 wounded, and 50 killed in the campaign so far. One KIA last turn, no wounded. Uh, aircraft losses last turn, five uh, P-40s, but five of those were ops losses uh, via like our transport. Actually, I think four of them were destroyed on the ground, so that seems wrong to me. Um, we had four on the ground anyway. He lost two Nates, one Oscar. Nothing, nothing really worth reporting there. Um, ship sunk. I don't think anything was sunk last turn. Let's take a look. Yeah, actually, we did lose the light transport, the Canopus, to a Japanese submarine south of Australia. Um, and I think that's about it. So, uh, that's where we're at right now, guys. Um, that's kind of my plans moving forward. It's a bit of a quiet turn. You could say this turn is all quiet on the Pacific front, minus China, which is still a raging inferno. Uh, but that's the situation right now, guys. That's that's where we're at. Um, we're building fortifications in Singapore. I think we're actually up to level uh, two, uh, but we've got a 35% on the way to level three. Johar Baru is level one, uh, hopefully gets to level two or level three shortly. And then Mersing is level one as well. Um, but the Japanese obviously have uh, forces there. Honestly, if we take Marisang, I think most of these troops will be out via rail even before he has time to march across the peninsula and cut them off, especially since we've got a brigade of infantry on the way. But we'll see. Oh, guys, I forgot one more thing here before we go. Um, we haven't, we lost sight of the Japanese uh, ships moving uh, north toward Midway, but I'm pretty convinced they are in fact going toward Midway. We saw them going northwest, so they could have theoretically been avoiding Midway, but I think he's going to make a play at Midway here in the next couple of turns. And the reason I'm almost certain of that now is is a cool little feature of this game. This game has something called SIGINT, so Signals Intelligence. And it's a little bit vague at times. It'll tell you things like radio transmission detected at Kamran Bay or uh, radio detections at uh, a certain hex on the map. And this is generally what the Japanese player sees. Sometimes they hear information about certain regiments being located at certain areas. But the Allies have a much better advantage in terms of signals intelligence because they get very specific reports much more often. And that's to reflect the fact that the Allies had a tremendous ability to break and read Japanese codes. It's how they won the Battle of Midway. They were able to determine where the Japanese were going to attack, what they were going to attack with, and they were able to respond. It was a big factor in the Americans' success at the Battle of Midway. I think we have gleaned our first bit of really actionable intelligence, and that is at the very top of the SIGINT report for December 15th, 1941, we have a report that says 124th Infantry Regiment. So the 24th Infantry Regiment, or at least a portion of it, is loaded on a, on a Shanghai Maru class AP, so troop transport, moving to Midway Island. So basically we know that a Japanese infantry regiment, or a portion of it, is on a transport ship somewhere in the Pacific moving toward Midway Island. Now, SIGINT can be wrong. That's worth pointing out. The intelligence here is not always foolproof. There is a bit of uh, fog of war uh, buried into it. But if we think like Nimitz had to before the actual Battle of Midway, 
we can we have an intelligence report that the Japanese are moving a infantry unit to the island of Midway. Two turns ago, we spotted Japanese aircraft carriers north of Johnston Island moving north in the general vicinity of Midway. One turn ago, we saw a Japanese task force. We couldn't identify if there were carriers. They were at the limit of our patrol aircraft range, but we still knew that a task force, which we believe is probably the same carrier task force, is moving north in the direction of Midway. So if we take that known information, the visual sightings, multiple visual sightings of carriers and then just warships moving north toward Midway, and we combine it with the signals intelligence that's telling us a land unit is moving to Midway, then it's a reasonable deduction, I think, to say that the Japanese are probably moving units in the direction of Midway and probably for an invasion. Now, interestingly enough, our, uh, our recon aircraft have not spotted the Japanese. Um, maybe we need to adjust their research, research uh, sweeps here a bit. Uh, maybe it's weather, I don't know. But uh, let's set this on the map. So if we have these guys going here, we've got this other unit. Wait, why is it not? It's not changing. It's supposed to change. It's supposed to show me where they're... So these guys are flying here north in this general direction. These guys are going to be flying a little bit further south. So actually, let's move... Let's move this unit a little bit further north. Like that. So now we'll cover this whole general direction as well as a southerly area as well. So that's currently the situation uh, that we're dealing with, but we have uh, no sighting of enemy ships, but we do know that two turns ago there were carriers moving north, last turn there were warships moving north, and this turn we have signals intelligence telling us a Japanese infantry regiment is loaded on board transport heading to Midway. I don't know how far away they are, but that's the direction they're going. I'm still moving my carriers in the opposite direction because I believe he's moving the entire Japanese KB or the all six of his fleet carriers at Midway. The last thing I want is my three carriers anywhere near him at Midway. Um, you know, maybe if his submarines sight my carriers, because we do have some submarines located pretty close to our carriers, maybe he'll change his tactics or course. Uh, but I, the last thing I want is a carrier duel between six and three. Even if we surprise him, we're still probably fucked. The American uh, aircraft at this period of time, the American crews are terrible. We're better off going where the carriers are not. So that's what I'm going to do. But at least we know or have a pretty good inclination that he's moving toward Midway Island. There's not really much I can do about that. I guess I can order these guys to build forts. I didn't realize there are no forts here. Um, but uh, if he's anywhere nearby, they're probably not going to finish before he arrives. Uh, our troops on shore, they're not going to be able to deal with the regiment. We've got a Marine Defense Battalion and a base force. Total assault value of about like 52. Without any forts, they've got no hope uh, against a Japanese regiment, which is probably like a 140 in terms of assault value and still getting some assault perks. Um, what might be worthwhile doing, though, is sending some of our submarines in this general direction to see if they can pick anything up or uh, if there does, you know, if there is something that materializes, then uh, then we can order them to maybe see if they can try and sink anything. Maybe we'll get a pot shot at a Japanese carrier. That would certainly be worth the risk. Anyway, guys, that's what I've got for you. Uh, jump back into the end of this last video and uh, just want to let you know that little interesting tidbit of information. I think it's really cool, by the way. Uh, I know I don't know how much XTRG knows about the signals intelligence in this game. The fact that it represents the real sort of hypo and, and, and SIGINT is, I think, one of the really interesting, cool little cat and mouse things that this game has. There's a lot of things that are overwhelming about this game, but one of the things that it really does a great job telling the story is telling sort of the cat and mouse of carrier battles early in the war as units sort of come together all of the different pieces of information and then it culminates in this big battle and while we probably won't have that here it's just cool that you could see like it can you you can imagine if this was later in the war and we had five carriers over here and he had six and we knew that an infantry regiment was moving in and we spotted these carriers moving north you know we might try and move our own carriers in and then it would all culminate in this really cool moment so kind of like we had a uh, well not really with Mersing. it was a little bit it was still similar but it wasn't quite intelligence related anyway guys there wasn't really anything else interesting 
in the signals intelligence. So I'll jump back into my original recording. I just created this here because frankly I hadn't, uh, I, I didn't remember to do it in my original recording. Um, with that being said, guys, I think that's going to do it for this episode of uh, War in the Pacific uh, Admirals Edition, our game against XTRG, XTRG. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.